Setting up a multicam stream to YouTube is actually really easy. You can do it in minutes with just two webcams and OBS Studio. But what can you stream? Well, actually, some pretty awesome stuff. We are going to set up all of these use cases in this video and make it super easy to follow. Chapter markers are down below. But before we do that, I'm gonna need a little bit of help. Thankfully, Obsbot has got us covered. More about these awesome cameras as we go through the video. Let's start with the easiest and most practical setup. First thing you always need to do is of course, go get OBS Studio. You're gonna find the download on obsproject.com. You're gonna use Windows, Mac, or Linux. Click on one of these links and it'll download the latest file. Once you're through the installation process, you should see your icon appear on the screen. Go ahead and right click this icon, this is really important, and run as administrator, and then click yes. If you're new to OBS, you're probably not gonna have all this extra stuff in here, so let's go ahead and start from zero by going to scene selection and then hit new. I'm gonna name this one multi-cam because that's what we're gonna be talking about and setting up today. Hit okay. And now you can see we are starting from scratch and we're gonna make this really quick and easy. Here's some quick need to know basics about running OBS. This is your scene column right here in the bottom left. This is where you're gonna add different things like a talking scene, podcast scene, basketball scene. So each scene is a collection of sources that you need for each situation. Your sources are where we're gonna put the webcams, where we're gonna put the audio, where we're gonna put whatever else we need in order to create your perfect live stream situation. Obviously you have your start streaming, your broadcast, your recording, all of these things are pretty easy to understand. But what's not easy to understand is your setting screen. So let's go ahead and hit settings. And you'll notice that there's a bunch of settings in here and they sound really intimidating, but they're really not. And so we're gonna focus on a very stable and basic overview of what you need to know. The settings are super important, but there's something even more important than that. And that is going up to the help tab and hitting check for updates. You wanna make sure that this thing says no updates are currently available because OBS likes to put out a lot of really critical updates and that can invalidate this tutorial or future tutorials. So make sure you're updated if you have already installed OBS in the past. So we're gonna take a quick walkthrough of these settings. I like to keep the automatic check for updates on startup enabled because that way I don't miss an update or forget and then something breaks on me. Going down to the outputs, you can automatically record when streaming, which is very useful if you wanna do streaming and recording at the same time. The next major thing you need to know is actually in the video tab. So go to the video tab and you're gonna to wanna to put your base and your output resolution to 1920 by 1080 usually is the case. You can also do 4K if you have a 4K monitor or if you have a really nice setup, you can do 4K, but generally speaking, it's just better to do 1920 by 1080. You can also do 60 frames per second if you're doing faster content, or you can do 30 frames per second if you're having trouble running this content. Either way is fine, just make sure it's consistent. To make things really simple on you, I'm not gonna go through the advanced settings today. I do have tons of tutorials on how to do that in my other videos, which you can hit in the description below. But for now, let's go with the simple route so we can get to some of the fun camera type stuff later on in the video. For simplicity on the streaming end, I would go with 4,000 to 6,000 kilobits per second. This make things really easy. Audio bitrate can stay at 160. It can also go up to 256 or 320 if you want the best audio, but usually most platforms recommend 160. For the video encoder, I would recommend H.264, especially if you have NVENC as that card has its own encoding chip, which makes things a lot better. If you have a laptop or something, then you may have to do X.264, which is basically your CPU encoding everything instead of your GPU. Uh, you're just gonna have to experiment with this, or you can check out a lot of my previous videos. We've talked at length about these sort of hardware differences. So yeah, if you need some advice on the encoding process, then go ahead and check the links in the description below or at the end of this video. If for encoder preset, you could probably leave this at P4 or P5 and just see how your system responds. Leave this unchecked, leave the audio encoder as it is. You're gonna wanna make sure that you choose a recording path that fits well for you preferably to an SSD or an M2 or something that has a bit of speed to it so it doesn't have any issues when it's recording. You're gonna to have to change these settings based on what your setup is. 
whether you're using cell data, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, or you have a big fancy computer like one back here, or you have a very small laptop that doesn't have a lot of juice behind it, you're gonna have to change these settings and fit what your specific scenario is. So use mine as a base, use my other videos as a base, but ultimately you're gonna need to experiment. That's the most important thing of all time when it comes to live streaming and recording in this environment. One thing you definitely don't need to experiment with is MKV. You need to have MKV as your recording format. It makes it very easy. And if you don't have this, then you could potentially lose your footage. Something that I have done, even though people told me for years to use MKV, I used MP4 because I thought MP4 would just be a lot easier to work with because I can just move it straight into my editing program. Unfortunately, one day I was filming a two hour long session and it crashed and I lost all that footage and that really sucked to have to redo. I just, it was not fun. So don't do what I did, use MKV. It makes it a lot easier. And there's an easy way I'm gonna show you in a second that it will auto convert to MP4 anyways. So just do it. Make sure you hit apply so it saves all of these settings. All right, if you wanna add a mic, then all you need to do is go to this mic auxiliary audio section and then just choose your mic and it will appear in the audio mixer down below. As you can see, it automatically put it down there as soon as I hit apply. So that's good. If I don't want this here, then I could just go disabled and apply again and it will remove it. Two more really important things super quickly and then we're gonna start setting up all your fun sources. So the first thing is going to the advanced column and the advanced column, keep your process priority above normal or high so your computer understands that it's more important than other applications and it will prioritize it and its resources to OBS, which, which is really obviously important. You don't want to touch any of this video stuff right here, but what you do want is you do want to hit this box right here in recording that says automatically remuxed MP4. This is where you'll get an easy conversion from your MKV file and it will automatically, once you're done recording or streaming, it will automatically convert that into a MP4 file for your video editing program. Scrolling down, I'm gonna be honest, you're not gonna need any of that. For your stream column though, make sure you hit apply before you do anything else. For your stream column, the best thing to do is literally just to sign in to your account if you're using YouTube or Twitch. If you're using something else in particular, they do have a custom section or a show all section where you can just put in your stream key or find a completely different service. Either way is fine, but you definitely want to ignore the streaming service setting recommendations. That is not a good thing. Uh, it will lie to you. Don't let it lie to you. Once you've done all of that, make sure you hit apply and hit okay. Okay, now onto the fun stuff. This is the Obsbot Tail Air. It is a new unit by Obsbot that is among their premium line. Also what Obsbot sent me was two other things, which included a remote control and these little adapter thingies. These little adapter thingies are ethernet to USB-C adapters. And because they sent me two Obsbot cameras, they actually sent me two adapters. I do love the box though, to be honest, this box is really neat. It comes with this little envelope thing. This little envelope says mastermind on air. So there's little papers inside this thing that are the quick start guide and also some other information, including the warranty policy. So what's really cool is actually this case. This case is sick. It has a nice texture to it. It feels rugged. It's not like a soft plastic. It has a nice durable material and it looks fun to carry around. The strap feels pretty good. It doesn't feel very cheap or anything like that, which is good because this product is premium. Let's unzip it and see how it looks. So one thing I was blown away by is how sleek this looks. You can see it swivels up and down. It also swivels left and right. And of course, uh, it has a little plastic spot over the lens. You can take that off when you're ready. It actually has a pretty good range of motion. It's not full 360, but it does have a really good range of motion. As you can see, the case is really awesome too because it's molded specifically to this thing. So it makes carrying it around really safe. Here are some other accessories, specifically some cords. So this cable comes with a little band around it to keep it nice and snug. This is a USB-C to USB-C cable. It's a few feet long. I'm guessing it's around three feet. It's just long enough that you need to be sort of close to your source of power, but it's not too short either, thankfully. It does come with a couple other pieces that are pretty important actually. And this goes into the connectivity discussion later. This piece is a USB-C to USB type A. 
So your typical connection is going to be for a lot of devices, a type A. So they wanted to make that accessible by having a little adapter piece. This other plastic bag of doom is another handy piece. This is a type C, a USB type C to double USB type C. And I believe that this has a data transfer and a power delivery type application. So you can actually stick this in the webcam and it will allow both the power delivery and the connectivity, the data rate. As you can see on the bottom of this, it has little prongs, probably for some sort of charging station, I would imagine. Uh, it has a nice grippy ring on the bottom, so it's not gonna slide around at pretty much at all. It also has some tripod threads, which is really handy. You could see a mini USB or mini HDMI, I believe it's a mini HDMI or micro HDMI and an SD card slot. The SD card is mandatory though. You will need to buy one, a micro SD, in order to update and do the firmware and stuff. So just be known of that. The front actually has a couple of light bars here. The top light bar is the, the one that actually is going to tell you the status of everything versus the four dots are going to be the power. It has on the side, it has a microphone, it has the, an aux, like a 3.5 millimeter jack, and it has a microphone. On the back, it has a power button, which has multiple functions, like holding it for three seconds, will turn it on and off, etc. And it has a USB-C uh, connector on the bottom as well, which is probably what you'll use primarily. In order to turn it on and off, you can hold the button for three seconds and you can see this little light pop up on the indicator light, which is on the gimbal part of the device. And it will also show you the power on the bottom, those little four little dots. Obviously one dot means it's low power. These little light indicators are really cool though, because they can tell you which one it is. Each one of them will have a different color when it recognizes that there are others around, which is really neat. And you can see it's already like starting to move in a smooth way, even when I'm it's not in focus on anything in particular. It's not just flying around like it was when it was off, which is really cool. And we will come back to this in a moment. But really cool presentation by Obsbot. But the other thing too is that this is pretty encased in one little case versus a typical camera bag like one of the, for my mirrorless camera is definitely not going to be this small or this portable or this inconspicuous this almost looks like a power bank but we're going to put that to the side and check out this remote this remote is pretty sick actually it has a uh, thin and wide for i assume the optical zoom so you can zoom in and zoom out depending on the camera which is pretty sick there's a little lock button on the side. I think that lock button is to lock all the functions in place. You can see that there's a one, two, and three. That means you can hook up to three devices. You can see it has this joystick and the joystick controls the gimbal for each of them. Then of course there's the power button, but this thing is dead. So I have to charge it and it's easy because it comes with a USB-C cable. You can just plug it right in to a wall outlet or whatever, and you can just charge it and let it sit there. But this is really cool. It's a really cool device. Honestly, I'm excited to use it. The charging cable is a USB type A to USB C. Again, same kind of style as the other cables, but this one has comes with a USB A already attached to it. These next two, I may or may not even use in this video, but they are pretty neat. And basically this is for when you want a wireless setup. This is one way to do a wireless setup. These things are USB C to ethernet or ethernet to USB C. So on one end, you would hook this cable to your OBSBOT tail air, and on the other, you would hook it into a ethernet cable, which would then go to a router. But for my purposes and your purposes, this probably won't be the easiest thing to, to do, but it's a really cool thing that they allow you to do. The remote control and these network cables, they are sold separately. So what's nice is they're not gonna charge you a premium for you not knowing what you needed. So if you need these things, you will know it and you will buy these separately. I actually have two of these cameras though. One of them is actually recording this footage right now from a top-down view. All right, moving on. Okay, so now we're ready to go ahead and set up the OBSBOT cameras actually into OBS. But first, before we do that, we need to actually put them on the desk. So I'm gonna take just a moment to do that. In order to rig the cameras to the desk, I actually have a helpful tool. We're going to be using these small rig desk clamps to get these cameras hooked up to the desk. 
This is not a sponsored video, but I do like their stuff and we're gonna be using these to mount the cameras to the desk. Okay, we have them set up. We're gonna go ahead and go back into the computer so I can show you their Connect app and then also feed that into OBS. Okay, so now we're back in OBS and there are two ways that you can do this. There's two ways you can add these sources. One, which would be the easier way, is you can just press Add Source and you can go to Video Capture Device. You can name this OBSBOT1 if you want, whatever you want, and then you could say Create New. And then you could look for your actual camera device, right? This is one way of doing it. These two cameras are not going to show up right now in this OBS window because they're being used in another window entirely, which I will show you in just a second. But just know that this is how you add a camera. You can click either of these and they should add. But let me show you another way. The other way of doing this is to go to your camera manufacturer's website and see if they have their own dedicated, you know, control center that you can actually customize how the cameras look before you put them into OBS. So that's what I did. I went ahead and grabbed their OBSBOT center, their control center, and I started customizing the webcams. And here's what it looks like actually in their program. As you can see, I have this camera angle right in front of me, which is on one of the two poles that you saw previously. And then I actually have a second camera angle right here. So my second camera shot is this next to the desk type friendly casual camera that a lot of content creators use on stream as well and then going back to this first one this camera angle would probably be better for a webcam in the corner of obs while you're playing a gameplay or doing something like that so as you can see in these two shots these two shots are lit very 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 differently right this one has a bit more of an actual main light to it and then the side light which is a little bit lesser quality for sure and then it's got this light back here which is again just kind of hanging out you do notice a little bit of the, the glaringness but if you notice from the other camera angle it doesn't do that with a good light so a good quality light is not going to cause that so as you can see on the settings here they have a bunch of different options including you know switching back and forth a lot of these settings we can go into further depth in its own video if we decide to go that route, but you can see there's a bunch of different things you can do here, including of which you can actually optical zoom, zoom in and out, which is nice. And then in the image tab, you can set a lot of features here. You can do HDR if you're in the 30 frame per second modes. You can do autofocus, which is what I'm doing, and it works quite well. You can do exposure, white balance, image, you know, and I customized this stuff the best I could because I found some of the auto settings weren't that great, but also this just very tricky lighting. So like this camera shot didn't do that well with the auto settings, but this other camera shot did. It did really well because this other camera shot, number two, is actually lit a lot better. So that's the reason why you're seeing a big discrepancy is because one is lit better than the other. If you ever have a tracking web camera, usually they go like this. If you wanna raise your hand up, they will light up and then they will start tracking you. Pretty cool. As you can see, the tracking is actually quite good. So it's gonna follow you wherever you go. And also later in the video, you're gonna see how amazing the tracking really is when we show you the skateboarding and the basketball sections and the soccer sections. It has a bunch of other settings in here as well, which we're not gonna go into, but we could in a future video. So subscribe if you wanna see more about these guys as well as some other tech that's literally hiding in the background over there, which we just don't want to, we don't want, we don't want you to see that all, all of that stuff. Here's another way of looking. Uh, I can actually switch between these two at any moment by just simply having the multi-view option enabled on the desktop. So I can actually switch between these two and you can see whatever you want to as when you're recording. So what's really cool about this device is that you can actually do a bunch of different resolution modes. For instance, I'm on 1080p 30 right now, but you can actually go into 4K 30 or 1080p 60. 1080p 60 is really smooth, just so you guys know. My only thing with it is that when you're in the 60 frames per second mode, you don't get HDR, which this, these cameras have HDR. 
and also it's zoomed in a little bit. So I actually prefer the wider shot. And for things like talking at a desk or in a camera setup, you really don't need a lot of high frame rate movement. That's more for if you're capturing high, you know, high action, basically. I'm keeping it 1080p 30 right now, but you could certainly do 4K 30 as well, and that'll look also pretty good. If you have certain kinds of LED lighting, like I do in the back with my sign, then it's not going to work very well. So for this video, I kept HDR recording off and I, I made all of the settings custom to fit my setup, which is important for each of you to know about all of my videos is that every production environment is different and you're going to need to experiment, like I've said, in a hundred times. As you'll see in the skateboarding and basketball sections, uh, this does have a bunch of tracking methods and although we didn't use all of them, just know, because I don't have like a random rabbit running around, they have a bunch of other different tracking modes, as you see here, like normal tracking, upper body, uh, upper body tracking, close up tracking, animal tracking, group tracking. You can set presets and all that fun stuff for them. And they have different tracking speeds, fast, standard, and slow. Slow be more like a cinematic -y type thing versus fast is just like for action and sports and type stuff. And again, we were hiding behind bushes and these things still kept a decent lock on to our general location around certain slopes it wasn't able to do the same but when you're just kind of peeking behind something and coming back like you'll see in one of the clips then it actually does a really good job of keeping track of where that person is as long as they re-enter at that same general location so aside from the tracking being one of my favorite things about these cameras the other favorite thing about this camera is actually the fact that it pretty much hooks up to anything. There are so many ports on this camera, as you saw from the unboxing, that it literally can, can hook up to almost any stream environment, which is really handy. I was recording wirelessly from my phone. I could have streamed out there when I was, when I was doing these recordings. I can do it at my desk, as you're seeing, hooked up to the USB-C connection. You can do wirelessly through NDI and stuff like that. You can also do wired through NDI. Uh, it's it's a whole thing. There's a lot of connection, a lot of accessibility. I don't think I've seen any other webcam that's, frankly, that's under $3,000 that has as much connectability as this thing. So that is like one of my favorite parts is that I always felt like there was another option for it. We showed off the director's grid and other clips, so I won't talk about that much, but basically having the ability to change the framing of the shot through the director's grid is a, is a huge deal. Like you can, see it on your screen and on your phone or whatever device you're using and you can see all these different shots the and you can pick which one is the best and i think that's a really cool feature i definitely used it out in the field especially with the soccer one because it can be kind of hard to keep track of where the ball is in relation to the person so that was a really cool handy feature the mobile app is really my is just top tier you can do basically everything on the desktop version of the app but in the mobile app. And the fact that I can take it to go and I could literally stream from anywhere is a really great thing. So I don't have to bring my big camera, my big bulky setup. I can literally just bring one little case that has the ops bot in it and my phone. And I'm pretty much good. And then some kind of audio equipment. A couple things to know about these cameras is that you do actually need a micro SD card. They don't come with them. So make sure that you plan accordingly if you're gonna use these or shoot with these that you bring a micro SD card and you insert it in and make sure that you update the firmware because some of the main features were actually absent except for through the firmware update. So make sure that you use the micro SD card to update the firmware and you'll be, you'll be set. To honestly wrap up these cameras, you can use them for so many different things, right? But the main thing that it's for is more of a live production environment these are kind of the middle ground between an actual mirrorless or DSLR camera at the price point that they're at. It's like, what would you rather? This is a high quality webcam, but it's not quite a mirrorless camera, but this moves and a mirrorless camera does not. So, and the mirrorless camera is like twice as expensive, if not three times or four times more expensive. So you pick and choose, but ultimately these things are pretty solid. So now that I have these cameras in the way that I like them in terms of how they look, I'm gonna go ahead and put them into OBS. And I'll show you two ways to do that. One is through virtual camera, which is just basically taking both of them simultaneously and it's putting them in. So let me show you that way. 
So now that they're going to the virtual camera, now we can port them into OBS. So go back to OBS, hit sources, and you're gonna wanna hit video capture device. And we're gonna do this one, we're gonna call this one Obsbot, oops, Obs, can't type, Obsbot uh, virtual cam. And we're gonna select the Obsbot virtual camera option. And as you can see, we actually have the camera showing up now. So now you can see me in OBS, which is really handy. So this is definitely one way you could do it. You can add the virtual cam and go with that route, but you don't necessarily have access to switching it in OBS and things like that, which is pretty desirable to have, obviously in everything in OBS. So what I would do is actually cancel out of this. I would actually remove this and I'll show you a different way. While we're at it, we need to go ahead and cancel out of our Obspot Center. Now that we have all of our settings, it should save those settings. We're going to stop the virtual camera, and then we're going to go ahead and close out of this program entirely. And now we're going to add them straight into our OBS as video capture devices. So let's do Obspot 1. Cool. Awesome. And as you can see, now we have Obspot 1. Or if we want this one to be the first one we can, probably makes sense that left to right would be one and two. So I'm gonna go with this one. As you can see, it kept all of our same settings. So that makes it nice and easy. And now we can add another one. So we'll do video capture device. We'll do Obsbot two. So now we have both Obsbot sources made, but to make this even better so we can switch between the sources, let's go ahead and create a new scene. We can call this one side camera angle. We can hit the plus sign in sources. We can go to video capture device and we can actually add one of these two back. And I believe the side one was the first one. Perfect. So now we have side camera angle and we can go and rename this one to, we can rename this scene to be our front camera angle. And we can disable this one or remove it all together, right? And now we can switch back and forth with hotkeys or just by clicking on the scene. Now you have a bare bones understanding of how to set up multiple cameras, especially like nicer cameras like these on your stream. There's a lot of nuance to it, but I think you can get the handle of it. You just have to practice and learn how to use these things. Now that you've seen what they can do in a studio setup for a recording or streaming session, we're gonna go ahead and take these outside and we're gonna see how they hold up against basketball, soccer, and skateboarding. So we're here at the skate park today. We're going to be learning how to set up a multicam stream or multicam setup with a couple of the tail airs that we got from Opsbot. And we're gonna ride around and see how the tracking does. And yeah, let's give it a shot. So one thing these things can do is you can actually open up the app, the Opsbot Start app. As long as they're on and running with the app, you'll actually be able to see them. So I can see both units in front of me right now, and I can actually connect to them via cell data. So let me go ahead and live stream with whichever one this is. It creates like a near field Bluetooth connection. As you can see, we're actually looking at through the camera's eyes right now, see which one it is, not that one. This right here is actually their director's grid which allows you to see different viewpoints of the camera and which one has like a wide shot, which one has a, has a closer end shot, and you can actually pick which one you like the best. So this wide shot looks pretty cool, so we'll go with that one. And then another thing you can do is hit this middle button right here. And now I can change the different ways that the picture looks. So in order to change the color temperature, I can actually go to the white balance setting right here and I can hit that. And I can actually change the temperature. And for this kind of environment, it's gonna to need to be pretty high. We'll do 6200 or 60, we'll do 6100. And as you can see, that looks a lot better. You can change the style. And we'll make this one outdoor. There we go. And that way it boosts up some of the, the lighter colors here. You can flip the shot by hitting this one. 
If you need your grid lines, then you can actually hit this button right here and it will put on the grid lines, although they might be a little hard to see. So this button is how you get to your media. Once you record something, it'll be right in here in your phone. You do have to allow access, but it, that's, it's still pretty easy. And we have a bunch of extra settings in here. We have gesture controls, built-in mic, if you want to sync it to with a better mic. You do audio settings. They even have a little bit of a noise reduction, but I will say the one thing about this that I've noticed is that it actually doesn't perform extremely well when it comes to syncing the audio. So I would recommend still having a different audio source. It can do a face autofocus, we'll enable that. We can do a face auto exposure, we'll go ahead and enable that too. You can even set ISO upper and lower limits, which is pretty sweet. So you can give it a range of ISO that you want it to hit and it will stay within that range. But this is really cool. You can actually change the frame rate. It goes from 30 to 60, but in order to catch some high action shots, I'm gonna go ahead and try some 60. You can see it kind of crops in a little bit when it goes to 60. You could do an H.264, H.265 encoder. You could set it to high bit rate and a 1080p or a 4K resolution. But if you do the 4K resolution, you're gonna to have to drop down to 30 frames per second, which is fine, because it's still gonna look nice, but just know that ahead of time. All right, there's a bunch of features down here as well. In order to be able to control the camera manually, you can actually hit this little icon right here, and that will show you your joystick controls. So I can actually lift this up and move it over, and you can see that it's actually moving the camera itself. And I'm moving it manually. I can even see us. Cool, so you can see I'm moving it quite a bit. It's got a huge range of motion. Like from end to end, it's actually pretty astounding. And the top right hand corner is what you actually, is what you're actually recording versus this is the entire canvas. So if you wanna zoom in, you can actually hit this button right here and you can see this picture is getting a lot tighter. This is an optical zoom, which basically means that you're able to digitally zoom in. And if you wanna increase the speed of the tracking, you can actually hit this little slider bar right here. That way, it's gonna go a little bit faster, which might be a little tough to control, all right? Or you can go really slow for a smoother shot. Be a little more cinematic. For the remote control, I did figure out, and let me see if I can replicate that now on camera. So first thing I have to do is turn it on by holding it for three seconds, holding the power button. I think it should be on now. You can see it by the light. It also makes a cute little noise, like beep, beep, beep. All right, so to pair it, you hit the button, the power button, three times really fast. One, two, three. And it should start blinking. In order to get it to pair to the remote, you're gonna have to hit this little person icon and hold down one, one two, or three at the same time. So in my case, you could see it very slightly lit up green, which means it's on camera profile number one. As you can see, it's gonna start moving when I move this joystick. So same thing as before, I'm going to hit the OBSBOT Connect app, and we're gonna see if we can find this particular camera. So once you select it, then you're gonna have access to being able to control it. And because I have the remote controller, I can actually use the controller and record what's happening. So now you can see where the controller would come in handy as a separate purchase if you wanted to. And for settings, I can do the different profile buttons. I can also take a quick picture. So we're gonna fix some of these settings here. Usually the audio settings are actually pretty decent for this type of thing. We're gonna take off UVC mode because we're not plugged it into anything. And we're gonna change our media settings to be a faster frame rate like before. And we're gonna do 60 frames per second because we're gonna be moving around a bit. You can see it changed some things there. High bit rate, H.264. All right, so now we're gonna adjust the picture a little bit because it's way, 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 way off color. Now the color looks a lot better. All right, here are some outside shots we got with the tail air.
All right, so that's a wrap. Quick shout out to Obsbot for sending me these awesome cameras and also shout out to them for giving you guys a discount opportunity. If you're interested in these cameras for whatever production environment that you need them for, the, they will be in the description below as well as a special discount code because on Prime Day, they're actually going to be selling these for 10% off what they normally are as well as you get the 5% off if you use my discount code in the description below. So 15% off, not a bad deal at all. There are some pros and some cons with these things, but I think that they are more than worth it enough if they fit your specific type of streaming environment. Some of the cons are the audio desyncing, but again, you would ideally have your own audio solution for that anyways. The tracking detection is a bit hypersensitive, so if I lift my hand, wave it around a little bit, it, it might actually unlock the tracking or it might shut it down. It just kind of depends, so that's something to be aware of. But then the pros for me are the tracking is really, really good. They have a lot of options for connectivity. You can pretty much put it in every setup. And then finally, the app is really awesome and the director's grid is really awesome. So those are kind of my pros and cons very quickly recapped, but there's always more to learn about OBS Studio and the tech that you can put in it. To get some more in-depth knowledge on how to set up your stream in particular with the encoding settings and, th and overlays and things like that, then make sure you hit these videos above my head. See you soon.